The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. Chapter 8 The Church of Google. Not long after Nietzsche bought his mechanical writing ball, an earnest young man named Frederick Winslow Taylor carried a stopwatch into the Midvale Steel Plant in Philadelphia and began a historic series of experiments aimed at boosting the efficiency of the plant's machinists. With the grudging approval of Midvale's owners, Taylor recruited a group of factory hands, set them to work on various metalworking machines, and recorded and timed their every movement. By breaking down each job into a sequence of small steps, and then testing different ways of performing them, he created a set of precise instructions, an algorithm we might say today, for how each worker should work. Midvale's employees grumbled about the strict new regime, claiming that it turned them into little more than automatons but the factory's productivity soared. More than a century after the invention of the steam engine, the Industrial Revolution had at last found its philosophy and its philosopher. Taylor's tight industrial choreography, his system as he liked to call it, was embraced by manufacturers throughout the country and in time around the world. Seeking maximum speed, maximum efficiency, and maximum output, factory owners used time and motion studies to organize their work and configure the jobs of their workers. The goal, as Taylor defined in his celebrated 1911 treatise, The Principles of Scientific Management, was able to identify and adopt for every job the one best method of work, and thereby to effect the gradual substitution of science for rule of thumb throughout the mechanic arts. Once his system was applied to all acts of manual labor, Taylor assured his many followers it would bring about a restructuring not only of industry, but of society creating a utopia of perfect efficiency. In the past, the man has been first, he declared. In the future, the system must be first. Taylor's system of measurement and optimization is still very much with us. It remains one of the underpinnings of industrial manufacturing. And now, thanks to the growing power that computer engineers and software coders wield over our intellectual and social lives, Taylor's ethic is beginning to govern the realm of the mind as well. The internet is a machine designed for the efficient, automated collection, transmission, and manipulation of information, and its legions of programmers are intent on finding the one best way, the perfect algorithm, to carry out the mental movements of what we've come to describe as knowledge work. Google's Silicon Valley headquarters, the Googleplex, is the internet's high church, and the religion practiced inside its walls is Taylorism. The company, says CEO Eric Schmidt, is founded around the science of measurement. It is striving to systematize everything it does. We try to be very data-driven and quantify everything, adds another Google executive, Marissa Mayer. We live in a world of numbers. Drawing on the terabytes of behavioral data it collects through its search engine and other sites, the company carries out thousands of experiments a day and uses the results to refine the algorithms that increasingly guide how all of us find information and extract meaning from it. What Taylor did for the work of the hand, Google is doing for the work of the mind. The company's reliance on testing is legendary. Although the design of its web pages may appear simple, even austere, each element has been subjected to exhaustive statistical and psychological research. Using a technique called split A-B testing, Google continually introduces tiny permutations in the way its sites look and operate and shows different permutations to different sets of users, and then compares how the variations influence the user's behavior, how long they stay on a page, the way they move their cursor about the screen, what they click on, what they don't click on, and where they go next. In addition to the automated online tests, Google recruits volunteers for eye tracking and other psychological studies at its in-house usability lab. Because web surfers evaluate the contents of pages so quickly that they make the most of their decisions unconsciously, remarked two Google researchers in a 2009 blog post about the lab, monitoring their eye movements is the next best thing to actually being able to read their minds. Irene Au, the company's director of user experience, says that Google relies on cognitive psychology research to further its goal of making people use their computers more efficiently. Subjective judgments, including aesthetic ones, don't enter into Google's calculations. On the web, says Mayer, design has become much more of a science than an art. 
because you can iterate so quickly, because you can measure so precisely, you can actually find small differences and mathematically learn which one is right. In one famous trial, the company tested 41 different shades of blue on its toolbar to see which shade drew the most clicks from visitors. It carries out similarly rigorous experiments on the text it puts on its pages. You have to try and make words less human and more a piece of the machinery, explains Mayer. In his 1993 book, Technopoly, Neil Postman distilled the main tenets of Taylor's system of scientific management. Taylorism, he wrote, is founded on six assumptions. That the primary, if not the only, goal of human labor and thought is efficiency. That technical calculation is in all respects superior to human judgment. That in fact, human judgment cannot be trusted because it is plagued by laxity, ambiguity, and unnecessary complexity. That subjectivity is an obstacle to clear thinking. That what cannot be measured either does not exist or is of no value. And that the affairs of citizens are best guided and conducted by experts. What's remarkable is how well Postman's summary encapsulates Google's own intellectual ethic. Only one tweak is required to bring it up to date. Google doesn't believe that the affairs of citizens are best guided by experts. It believes that those affairs are best guided by software algorithms, which is exactly what Taylor would have believed had powerful digital computers been around in his day. Google also resembles Taylor in the sense of righteousness it brings to its work. It has a deep, even messianic faith in its cause. Google, says its CEO, is more than a mere business. It is a, quote, moral force. The company's much publicized mission is to organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. Fulfilling that mission, Schmidt told the Wall Street Journal in 2005, will take, current estimate, 300 years. The company's more immediate goal is to create the perfect search engine, which it defines as something that understands exactly what you mean and gives you back exactly what you want. In Google's view, information is a kind of commodity, a utilitarian resource that can and should be mined and processed with industrial efficiency. The more pieces of information we can access and the faster we can distill their gist, the more productive we become as thinkers. Anything that stands in the way of speedy collection, dissection, and transmission of data is a threat not only to Google's business, but to the new utopia of cognitive efficiency it aims to construct on the internet. Google was born of an analogy, Larry Page's analogy. The son of one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, Page was surrounded by computers from an early age. He recalls being, quote, the first kid in my elementary school to turn in a word process document, and went on to study engineering as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. His friends remember him as being ambitious, smart, and nearly obsessed with efficiency. While serving as president of Michigan's Engineering Honor Society, he spearheaded a brash, if ultimately futile, campaign to convince the school's administrators to build a monorail through the campus. In the fall of 1995, Page headed to California to take a prized spot in Stanford University's doctoral program in computer science. Even as a young boy, he had dreamed of creating a momentous invention, something that would, quote, change the world. He knew there was no better place than Stanford, Silicon Valley's frontal cortex, to make the dream come true. It took only a few months for Page to land on a topic for his dissertation, the vast new computer network called the World Wide Web. Launched on the internet just four years earlier, the web was growing explosively. It had half a million sites and was adding more than 100,000 new ones every month. And the network's incredibly complex and ever-shifting arrangement of nodes and links had come to fascinate mathematicians and computer scientists. Page had an idea that he thought might unlock some of its secrets. He had realized that the links on web pages are analogous to the citations in academic papers. Both are signifiers of value. When a scholar, in writing an article, makes a reference to a paper published by another scholar, she is vouching for the importance of that other paper. The more citations a paper garners, the more prestige it gains in its field. In the same way, when a person with a web page links to someone else's page, 
She is saying that she thinks the other page is important. The value of any web page, Page saw, could be gauged by the links coming into it. Page had another insight, again drawing on the citation's analogy. Not all links are created equal. The authority of any web page can be gauged by how many incoming links it attracts. A page with a lot of incoming links has more authority than a page with only one or two. The greater the authority of a web page, the greater the worth of its own outgoing links. The same is true in academia. Earning a citation from a paper that has itself been much cited is more valuable than receiving one from a less cited paper. Page's analogy led him to realize that the relative value of any web page could be estimated through a mathematical analysis of two factors. The number of incoming links the page attracted and the authority of the sites that were the sources of those links. If you could create a database of all the links on the web, you would have the raw material to feed into a software algorithm that could evaluate and rank the value of all the pages on the web. You would also have the makings of the world's most powerful search engine. The dissertation never got written. Page recruited another Stanford graduate student, a math prodigy named Sergey Brin, who had a deep interest in data mining to help him build his search engine. In the summer of 1996, an early version of Google, then called Backrub, <laughs> debuted on Stanford's website. Within a year, Backrub's traffic had overwhelmed the university's network. If they were going to turn their search engine into a real business, Page and Brin saw they were going to need a lot of money to buy computing gear and network bandwidth. In the summer of 1998, a wealthy Silicon Valley investor came to the rescue, cutting them a check for a hundred grand. They moved their budding company out of their dorms and into a couple of spare rooms in a friend of a friend's house in nearby Menlo Park. In September, they incorporated as Google Inc. They chose the name, a play on Google, the word for the number 10 raised to the hundredth power, to highlight their goal of organizing, quote, a seemingly infinite amount of information on the web. In December, an article in PC Magazine praised the new search engine with the quirky name, saying it has an uncanny knack for returning extremely relevant results. Thanks to that knack, Google was soon processing most of the millions and then billions of internet searches being conducted every day. The company became fabulously successful, at least as measured by the traffic running through its site. But it faced the same problem that had doomed many dot-coms. It hadn't been able to figure out how to turn a profit from all that traffic. No one would pay to search the web, and Page and Brin were averse to injecting advertisements into their search results, fearing it would corrupt Google's pristine mathematical objectivity. We expect, they had written in a scholarly paper early in 1998, that advertising-funded search engines will be inherently biased toward the advertisers and away from the needs of the consumers. But the young entrepreneurs knew that they would not be able to live off the largesse of venture capitalists forever. Late in 2000, they came up with a clever plan for running small textual advertisements along their search results, a plan that would require only a modest compromise for their ideals. Rather than selling advertising space for a set price, they decided to auction the space off. It wasn't an original idea. Another engine, GoTo, was already auctioning ads, but Google gave it a new spin. Whereas GoTo ranked its search ads according to the size of the advertiser's bids, the higher the bid, the more prominent the ad, Google in 2002 added a second criterion. An ad's placement would be determined not only by the amount of the bid, but by the frequency with which people actually clicked the ad. That innovation ensured that Google's ads would remain, just as the company put it, relevant to the topics of searches. Junk ads would automatically be screened from the system. If searchers didn't find an ad relevant, they wouldn't click on it, and it would eventually disappear from Google's site. The auction system, named AdWords, had another very important result. By tying ad placements to clicks, it increased click-through rates substantially. The more often people clicked on an ad, the more frequently and prominently the ad would appear on search result pages, bringing even more clicks. Since advertisers paid Google by the click, the company's revenues soared. The AdWords system proved so lucrative that many other web publishers contracted with Google to place its contextual ads on their sites as well. 
tailoring the ads to the content of each page. By the end of the decade, Google was not just the largest internet company in the world. It was one of the largest media companies, taking in more than $22 billion in sales a year, almost all of it from advertising, and turning a profit of about $8 billion. Page and Brin were each worth, on paper, more than $10 billion. Google's innovations have paid off for its founders and investors, but the biggest beneficiaries have been web users. Google has succeeded in making the internet a far more efficient informational medium. Earlier search engines tended to get clogged with data as the web expanded. They couldn't index the new content, much less separate the wheat from the chaff. Google's engine, by contrast, has been engineered to produce better results as the web grows. The more sites and links Google evaluates, the more precisely it can classify pages and rank their quality. And as traffic increases, Google is able to collect more behavioral data, allowing it to tailor its search results and advertisements ever more precisely to users' needs and desires. The company has also invested many billions of dollars in building computer-packed data centers around the world, ensuring that it can deliver search results to its users in milliseconds. Google's popularity and profitability are well-deserved. The company plays an invaluable role in helping people navigate the hundreds of billions of pages that now populate the web. Without its search engine and the other engines that have been built on its model, the internet would have long ago become a tower of digital babel. But Google, as the supplier of the web's principal navigational tools, also shapes our relationship with the content that it serves up so efficiently and in such profusion. The intellectual technologies it has pioneered promote the speedy, superficial skimming of information and discourage any deep, prolonged engagement with a single argument, idea, or narrative. Our goal, says Irene Au, is to get users in and out really quickly. All our design decisions are based on that strategy. Google's profits are tied directly to the velocity of people's information intake. The faster we surf across the surface of the web, the more links we click and pages we view, the more opportunities Google gains to collect information about us and to feed us advertisements. Its advertising system, moreover, is explicitly designed to figure out which messages are most likely to grab our attention and then to place those messages in our field of view. Every click we make on the web marks a break in our concentration, a bottom-up disruption of our attention, and it's in Google's economic interest to make sure we click as often as possible. The last thing the company wants is to encourage leisurely reading or slow, concentrated thought. Google is, quite literally, in the business of distraction. Google may yet turn out to be a flash in the pan. The lives of internet companies are rarely nasty or brutish, but they do tend to be short. Because their businesses are ethereal, constructed of invisible strands of software code, their defenses are fragile. All it takes to render a thriving online business obsolete is a sharp programmer with a fresh idea. The invention of a more precise search engine or a better way to circulate ads through the net could spell ruin for Google. But no matter how long the company is able to maintain its dominance over the flow of digital information, its intellectual ethic will remain the general ethic of the internet as a medium. Web publishers and toolmakers will continue to attract traffic and make money by encouraging and feeding our hunger for small, rapidly dispensed pieces of information. The history of the web suggests that the velocity of data will only increase. During the 1990s, most online information was found on so-called static pages. They didn't look at all that different from the pages in magazines, and their content remained relatively fixed. The trend since then has been to make pages ever more dynamic, updating them regularly and often automatically with new content. Specialized blogging software, introduced in 1999, made rapid-fire publishing simple for everyone, and the most successful bloggers soon found that they needed to post many items a day to keep a fickle reader engaged. News sites followed suit, serving up fresh stories around the clock. RSS readers, which became popular around 2005, allowed sites to push headlines and other bits of information to web users, putting an even greater premium on the frequency of information delivery. The greatest acceleration has come recently with the rise of social networks like MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter. 
These companies are dedicated to providing their millions of members with a never-ending stream of real-time updates. Brief messages about, as the Twitter slogan puts it, what's happening right now. By turning intimate messages, once the realm of the letter, the phone call, the whisper, into fodder for a new form of mass media, the social networks have given people a compelling new way to socialize and stay in touch. They've also placed a whole new emphasis on immediacy. A status update from a friend, coworker, or favorite celebrity loses its currency within moments of being issued. To be up to date requires the continual monitoring of message alerts. The competition among the social networks to deliver even fresher and more plentiful messages is fierce. When in early 2009, Facebook responded to Twitter's rapid growth by announcing that it was revamping its site to, as it put, increase the pace of the stream, its founder and chief executive Mark Zuckerberg assured its quarter of a billion members that the company would continue making the flow of information even faster. Unlike early book printers who had strong economic incentives to promote the reading of older works as well as recent ones, online publishers battle to distribute the newest of the new. Google hasn't been sitting still. To combat the upstarts, it has been revamping its search engine to ratchet up its speed. The quality of a page, as determined by the links coming into it, is no longer Google's chief criterion in ranking search results. In fact, it's now only one of 200 different signals that the company monitors and measures, according to Amit Singhal, a top Google engineer. One of its major thrusts has been to place a greater priority on what it calls the freshness of the pages it recommends. Google not only identifies new or revised web pages much more quickly than it used to, it now checks the most popular sites for updates every few seconds rather than every few days. But for many searches, it skews its results to favor newer pages over older ones. In May of 2009, the company introduced a new twist to its search service allowing users to bypass considerations of quality entirely and have results ranked according to how recently the information was posted to the web. A few months later, it announced the next generation architecture for its search engine that bore the telling code name Caffeine. Citing Twitter's achievements in speeding the flow of data, Larry Page said that Google wouldn't be satisfied until it is able to index the web every second to allow real-time search. The company is also striving to further expand its hold on web users and their data. With the billions in profits churned out by AdWords, it has been able to diversify well beyond its original focus on searching web pages. It now has specialized search services for, among other things, images, videos, news stories, maps, blogs, and academic journals, all of which feed into the results supplied by its main search engine. It also offers computer operating systems such as Android for smartphones and Chrome for PCs, as well as a slew of online software programs or apps, including email, word processing, blogging, photo storage, feed reading, spreadsheets, calendars, and web hosting. Google Wave, an ambitious social networking service launched at the end of 2009, allows people to monitor and update various multimedia message threads on a single densely packed page which refreshes its contents automatically and almost instantaneously. Wave, says one reporter, turns conversations into fast-moving group streams of consciousness. The company's boundless expansiveness has been a matter of much discussion, particularly among management scholars and business reporters. The breadth of its influence and activity is often interpreted as evidence that it is an entirely new species of business, one that transcends and redefines all traditional categories. But while Google is an unusual company in many ways, its business strategy is not quite as mysterious as it seems. Google's protean appearance is not a reflection of its main business, selling and distributing online ads. Rather, it stems from the vast number of complements to that business. Complements are, in economic terms, any products or services that tend to be purchased or consumed together, such as hot dogs and mustard, or lamps and light bulbs. For Google, everything that happens on the internet is a complement to its main business. As people spend more time and do more things online, they see more ads, and they disclose more information about themselves, and Google rakes in the money. As additional products and services have come to be delivered digitally over computer networks, entertainment, news, 
software applications, financial transactions, phone calls. Google's range of complements has extended into ever more industries. Because the sales of complementary products rise in tandem, a company has a strong strategic interest in reducing the cost and expanding the availability of the complements to its main product. It's not too much of an exaggeration to say that a company would like all complements to be given away. If hot dogs were free, mustard sales would skyrocket. It's this natural drive to reduce the cost of complements that more than anything else explains Google's business strategy. Nearly everything the company does is aimed at reducing the cost and expanding the scope of internet use. Google wants information to be free because as the cost of information falls, we all spend more time looking at computer screens and the company's profits go up. Most of Google's services are not profitable in themselves. Industry analysts estimate, for example, that YouTube, which Google bought for $1.65 billion in 2006, lost between $200 million and $500 million in 2009. But because popular services like YouTube enable Google to collect more information, to funnel more users toward its search engine, and to prevent would-be competitors from gaining footholds in its markets, the company is able to justify the cost of launching them. Google has let it be known that it won't be satisfied until it stores 100% of user data. Its expansionary zeal isn't just about money, though. The steady colonization of additional types of content also furthers the company's mission of making the world's information universally accessible and useful. Its ideals and its business interests converge in one overarching goal, to digitize ever more types of information, move the information onto the web, feed it into its database, run it through its classification and ranking algorithms, and dispense it in what it calls snippets to web servers, preferably with ads in tow. With each expansion of Google's ambit, its Taylorist ethic gains a tighter hold on our intellectual lives. The most ambitious of Google's initiatives, what Marissa Mayer calls its moonshot, is its effort to digitize all the books ever printed and make their text discoverable and searchable online. The program began in secret in 2002 when Larry Page set up a digital scanner in his office in the Googleplex and, to the beat of a metronome, spent a half hour methodically scanning the pages of a 300-page book. He wanted to get a rough sense of how long it would take to digitally scan every book in the world. The next year, a Google employee was sent to Phoenix to buy a pile of old books at a charity sale. Once carted back to the Googleplex, the volumes became the test subjects in a series of experiments that led to the development of a new high-speed and non-destructive scanning technique. The ingenious system, which involves the use of stereoscopic infrared cameras, is able to automatically correct for the bowing of pages that occurs when a book is opened, eliminating any distortion of the text in the scanned image. At the same time, a team of Google software engineers was fine-tuning a sophisticated character recognition program able to handle odd type sizes, unusual fonts, or other unexpected peculiarities in 430 different languages. Another group of Google employees spread out to visit leading libraries and book publishers to gauge their interest in having Google digitize their books. In the fall of 2004, Page and Brin formally announced the Google Print program, it would later be renamed Google Book Search, at the Frankfurt Book Fair, an event that since Gutenberg's day has been the publishing industry's chief annual gathering. More than a dozen trade and academic presses signed on as Google's partners, including such top names as Houghton Mifflin, McGraw-Hill, and the university presses of Oxford, Cambridge, and Princeton. Five of the world's most prestigious libraries, including Harvard's Widener, Oxford's Bodleian, and the New York Public Library also agreed to collaborate in the effort. They granted Google permission to begin scanning the contents of their stacks. By the end of the year, the company already had the text of an estimated 100,000 books in this databank. Not everyone was happy with the library scanning project. Google was not just scanning old books that had fallen out of copyright protection, it was also scanning newer books that, while often out of print, were still the copyrighted property of their authors or publishers. Google made it clear 
that it had no intention of tracking down and securing the consent of the copyright holders in advance. Rather, it would proceed to scan all the books and include them in its database unless a copyright owner sent in a formal written request to exclude a particular book. On September 20th, 2005, the Authors Guild, along with three prominent writers acting individually, sued Google, alleging that the scanning program entailed massive copyright infringement. A few weeks later, the Association of American Publishers filed another lawsuit against the company, demanding that it stop scanning the library's collections. Google fired back, launching a public relations offensive to publicize the societal benefits of Google Book Search. In October, Eric Schmidt wrote an op-ed column for the Wall Street Journal that portrayed the book digitization effort in terms at once stirring and vainglorious. Imagine the cultural impact of putting tens of millions of previously inaccessible volumes into one vast index, every word of which is searchable by anyone, rich and poor, urban and rural, first world and third, en tout long, and all, of course, entirely for free. The suits proceeded. After three years of negotiations, during which Google scanned some 7 million additional books, 6 million of which were still under copyright, the parties reached a settlement. Under the terms of the accord, announced in October 2008, Google agreed to pay $125 million to compensate the owners of the copyrights in the works that it had already scanned. It also agreed to set up a payment system that would give authors and publishers a cut of advertising and other revenues earned from the Google Book search service in the years ahead. In return for the concessions, the authors and publishers gave Google their OK to proceed with its plan to digitize all the world's books. The company would also be authorized to, in the United States, sell subscriptions to an institutional subscription database, sell individual books, place advertisements on online book pages, and make other commercial uses of books. The proposed settlement set off another, even fiercer controversy. The terms appeared to give Google a monopoly over the digital versions of millions of so-called orphan books, those whose copyright owners are unknown or can't be found. Many libraries and schools feared that, without competition, Google would be able to raise the subscription fees for its book database as high as it liked. The American Library Association, in a court filing, warned that the company might set the price of the subscription at a profit-maximizing point beyond the reach of many libraries. The U.S. Justice Department and Copyright Office both criticized the deal, contending it would give Google too much power over the future market for digital books. Other critics had a related but more general worry, that commercial control over the distribution of digital information would inevitably lead to restrictions on the flow of knowledge. They were suspicious of Google's motives despite its altruistic rhetoric. When businesses like Google look at libraries, they do not merely see temples of learning, wrote Robert Darnton, who, in addition to teaching at Harvard, oversees its library system. They see potential assets, or what they call content, ready to be mined. Although Google has pursued a laudable goal in promoting access to information, conceded Darnton, Granting a profit-making enterprise a monopoly, not of railroads or steel, but of access to information, would entail too great a risk. What will happen if its current leaders sell the company or retire, he asked. What will happen if Google favors profitability over access? By the end of 2009, the original agreement had been abandoned, and Google and the other parties were trying to win support for a slightly less sweeping alternative. The debate over Google Book Search is illuminating for several reasons. It reveals how far we still have to go to adapt the spirit and letter of copyright law, particularly its fair use provisions, to the digital age. The fact that some of the publishing firms that were parties to the lawsuit against Google are also partners in Google Book Search testifies to the murkiness of the current situation. It also tells us much about Google's high-flown ideals and the high-handed methods it sometimes uses to pursue them. One observer, the lawyer and technology writer Richard Komen, argued that Google has become a true believer in its own goodness, a belief which justifies its own set of rules regarding corporate ethics, anti-competition, customer service, and its place in society. Most important of all, the controversy makes clear that the world's books will be digitized, and that the effort 
is likely to proceed quickly. The argument against Google Book Search has nothing to do with the wisdom of scanning printed books into a database. It has to do with the control and commercialization of that database. Whether or not Google ends up being the sole proprietor of what Darton calls the largest library in the world, that library is going to be constructed, and its digital volumes fed through the net into every library on Earth will in time supplant many of the physical books that have long been stored on shelves. The practical benefits of making books discoverable and searching online are so great that it's hard to imagine anyone opposing the effort. The digitization of old books, as well as ancient scrolls and other documents, is already opening exciting new avenues for research into the past. Some foresee a second renaissance of historical discovery. As Darton says, digitize we must. But the inevitability of turning the pages of books into online images should not prevent us from considering the side effects. To make a book discoverable and searchable online is also to dismember it. The cohesion of its text, the linearity of its argument or narrative as it flows through scores of pages, is sacrificed. What that ancient Roman craftsman wove together when he created the first codex is unstitched. The quiet that was part of the meaning of the codex is sacrificed as well. Surrounding every page or snippet of text on Google Book Search is a welter of links, tools, tabs, and ads, each eagerly angling for a share of the reader's fragmented attention. For Google, with its faith and efficiency as the ultimate good and a tenant desire to get users in and out really quickly, the unbinding of the book entails no loss, only gain. Google Book Search manager Adam Maths grants that the books often live in a vibrant life offline, but he says that they'll be able to live an even more exciting life online. What does it mean for a book to lead a more exciting life? Searchability is only the beginning. Google wants us, it says, to be able to slice and dice the contents of the digitized books we discover, to do all the linking, sharing, and aggregating that are routine with web content, but that you can't easily do with physical books. The company has already introduced a cut and paste tool that lets you easily clip and publish passages from public domain books on your blog or website. It has also launched a service it calls Popular Passages, which highlights brief excerpts from books that have been quoted frequently, and for some volumes it has begun displaying word clouds that allow a reader to, as the company says, explore a book in 10 seconds. It would be silly to complain about such tools. They are useful. But they also make it clear that, for Google, the real value of a book is not as a self-contained literary work, but as another pile of data to be mined. The great library that Google is rushing to create shouldn't be confused with the libraries we've known up until now. It's not a library of books. It's a library of snippets. The irony in Google's effort to bring greater efficiency to reading is that it undermines the very different kind of efficiency that the technology of books brought to reading and to our minds in the first place. By freeing us from the struggle of decoding text, the form that writing came to take on a page of parchment or paper enabled us to become deep readers, to turn our attention and our brain power to the interpretation of meaning. With writing on the screen, we're still able to decode text quickly. We read, if anything, faster than ever. But we're no longer guided toward a deep, personally constructed understanding of the text connotations. Instead, we're hurried off toward another bit of related information, and then another, and another. The strip mining of relevant content replaces the slow excavation of meaning. It was a warm summer morning in Concord, Massachusetts. The year was 1844. An aspiring novelist named Nathaniel Hawthorne was sitting in a small clearing in the woods, a particularly peaceful spot known around town as Sleepy Hollow. Deep in concentration, he was attending to every passing impression, turning himself into what Emerson, the leader of Concord's transcendentalist movement, had eight years earlier termed a transparent eyeball. Hawthorne saw, as he would record in his notebook later that day, how sunshine glimmers through shadow, and shadow effaces sunshine, imaging that pleasant mood of wind where gaiety and pensiveness intermingle. He felt a slight breeze, the gentlest sigh imaginable, yet with a spiritual potency, 
insomuch that it seems to penetrate with its mild ethereal coolness through the outward clay and breathe upon the spirit itself which shivers with gentle delight. He smelled on the breeze a hint of the fragrance of the white pines. He heard the striking of the village clock and at a distance mowers wetting their scythes. Though these sounds of labor when at a proper remoteness do but increase the quiet of one who lies at his ease all in a mist of his own musings. Abruptly, his reverie was broken. But hark, there is the whistle of the locomotive, the long shriek, harsh, above all other harshness. For the space of a mile cannot mollify it into harmony. It tells a story of busy men, citizens from the hot street who have come to spend a day in a country village, men of business. In short, of all unquietness, and no wonder that it gives such a startling shriek, since it brings the noisy world into the midst of our slumberous peace. Leo Marx opens The Machine in the Garden, his classic 1964 study of technology's influence on American culture, with a recounting of Hawthorne's morning in Sleepy Hollow. The writer's real subject, Marx argues, is the landscape of the psyche, and in particular the contrast between two conditions of consciousness. The quiet clearing in the woods provides the solitary thinker with a singular insulation from disturbance, a protected space for reflection. The clamorous arrival of the train with its load of busy men brings the psychic dissonance associated with the onset of industrialism. The contemplative mind is overwhelmed by the noisy world's mechanical busyness. The stress that Google and other internet companies place on the efficiency of information exchange as the key to intellectual progress is nothing new. It's been, at least since the start of the Industrial Revolution, a common theme in the history of the mind. It provides a strong and continuing counterpoint to the very different view promulgated by the American transcendentalists as well as the other, earlier English romantics, that true enlightenment comes only through contemplation and introspection. The tension between the two perspectives is one manifestation of the broader conflict between, in Marx's terms, the machine and the garden, the industrial ideal and the pastoral ideal that has played such an important role in shaping modern society. When carried into the realm of the intellect, the industrial ideal of efficiency poses, as Hawthorne understood, a potentially mortal threat to the pastoral ideal of meditative thought. That doesn't mean that promoting the rapid discovery and retrieval of information is bad. It's not. The development of a well-rounded mind requires both an ability to find and quickly parse a wide range of information and a capacity for open-ended reflection. There needs to be time for efficient data collection and time for inefficient contemplation, time to operate the machine and time to sit idly in the garden. We need to work in Google's world of numbers, but we also need to be able to retreat to Sleepy Hollow. The problem today is that we're losing our ability to strike a balance between those two very different states of mind. Mentally, we're in perpetual locomotion. Even as Gutenberg's press was making the literary mind the general mind, it was setting in motion the process that now threatens to render the literary mind obsolete. When books and periodicals began to flood the marketplace, people for the first time felt overwhelmed by information. Robert Burton, in his 1628 masterwork, An Anatomy of Melancholy, described the vast chaos and confusion of books that confronted the 17th century reader. We are oppressed with them, our eyes ache with reading, our fingers with turning. A few years earlier, in 1600, Another English writer, Barnaby Rich, had complained, One of the great diseases of this age is the multitude of books that doth so overcharge the world that it is not able to digest the abundance of idle matter that is every day hatched and brought into the world. Ever since, we have been seeking, with mounting urgency, new ways to bring order to the confusion of information we face every day. For centuries, the methods of personal information management tended to be simple, manual, and idiosyncratic. Filing and shelving routines, alphabetization, annotation, notes and lists, catalogs and concordances, rules of thumb. 
There were also the more elaborate, but still largely manual institutional mechanisms for sorting and storing information found in libraries, universities, and commercial and government bureaucracies. During the 20th century, as the information flood swelled and data processing technologies advanced, the methods and tools for both personal and institutional information management became more elaborate, more systematic, and increasingly automated. We began to look to the very machines that exacerbated information overload for ways to alleviate the problem. Vannevar Bush sounded the keynote for our modern approach to managing information in his much-discussed article, As We May Think, which appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in 1945. Bush, an electrical engineer who had served as Franklin Roosevelt's science advisor during World War II, worried that progress was being held back by scientists' inability to keep abreast of information relevant to their work. The publication of new material, he wrote, has been extended far beyond our present ability to make use of the record. The summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate, and the means we use for threading through the consequent maze to the momentarily important item is the same as was used in the days of square-rigged ships. But a technological solution to the problem of information overload was, Bush argued, on the horizon. The world has arrived at an age of cheap, complex devices of great reliability, and something is bound to come of it. He proposed a new kind of personal cataloging machine, called a Memex, which would be useful not only to scientists, but to anyone employing logical processes of thought. Incorporated into a desk, the Memex, Bush wrote, is a device in which an individual stores, in compressed form, all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. On top of the desk are translucent screens, onto which are projected images of the stored materials, as well as a keyboard and sets of buttons and levers to navigate the database. The essential feature of the machine is its use of associative indexing to link different pieces of information. Any item may be caused at will to select immediately and automatically another one. This process of tying two things together is, Bush emphasized, the important thing. With his Memex, Bush anticipated both the personal computer and the hypermedia system of the World Wide Web. His article inspired many of the original developers of PC hardware and software, including such early devotees of hypertext as the famed computer engineer Douglas Engelbart and HyperCard's inventor, Bill Atkinson. But even though Bush's vision had been fulfilled to an extent beyond anything he could have imagined in his own lifetime, we are surrounded by the Memex offspring. The problem he set out to solve, information overload, has not abated. In fact, it's worse than ever. As David Levy has observed, the development of personal digital information systems and the global hypertext seems not to have solved the problem, but exacerbated it. In retrospect, the reason for the failure seems obvious. By dramatically reducing the cost of creating, storing, and sharing information, computer networks have placed far more information within our reach than we have ever had access to before. And the powerful tools for discovering, filtering, and distributing information developed by companies like Google ensure that we are forever inundated by information of immediate interest to us, and in quantities well beyond what our brains can handle. As the technologies for data processing improve, as our tools for searching and filtering become more precise, the flood of relevant information only intensifies. More of what is of interest to us becomes visible to us. Information overload has become a permanent affliction, and our attempts to cure it just make it worse. The only way to cope is to increase our scanning and our skimming, to rely even more heavily on the wonderfully responsive machines that are the source of the problem. Today, more information is available to us than ever before, writes Levy, but there is less time to make use of it, and specifically to make use of it with any depth of reflection. Tomorrow, the situation will be worse still. It was once understood that the most effective filter of human thought is time. The best rule of reading will be a method from nature and not a mechanical one, 
wrote Emerson in his 1858 essay, Books. All writers must submit their performance to the wise ear of time who sits and weighs, and ten years hence out of a million of pages reprints one. Again, it is judged, it is winnowed by all the winds of opinion, and what terrific selection has not passed on it before it can be reprinted after twenty years, and reprinted after a century. We no longer have the patience to await time's slow and scrupulous winnowing. Inundated at every moment by information of immediate interest, we have little choice but to resort to automated filters, which grant their privilege instantaneously to the new and the popular. On the net, the winds of opinion have become a whirlwind. Once the train has disgorged its cargo of busy men and steamed out of the Concord station, Hawthorne tried, with little success, to return to his deep state of concentration. He glimpsed an anthill at his feet, and, like a malevolent genius, tossed a few grains of sand onto it, blocking the entrance. He watched one of the inhabitants, returning from some public or private business, struggle to figure out what had become of his home. What surprise, what hurry, what confusion of mind are expressed in his movement? How inexplicable to him must be the agency which has effected this mischief. But Hawthorne was soon distracted by the travails of the ant. Noticing a change in the flickering pattern of shade and sun, he looked up at the clouds scattered about the sky, and discerned in their shifting forms the shattered ruins of a dreamer's utopia. In 2007, the American Association for the Advancement of Science invited Larry Page to deliver the keynote address at its annual conference, the country's most prestigious meeting of scientists. Page's speech was a rambling, off-the-cuff affair, but it provided a fascinating glimpse into the young entrepreneur's mind. Once again, finding inspiration in an analogy, he shared with the audience his conception of human life and human intellect. My theory is that if you look at your programming, your DNA, it's about 600 megabytes compressed, he said. So it's smaller than any modern operating system, smaller than Linux or Windows. And that includes booting up your brain by definition. So your program algorithms probably aren't that complicated. Intelligence is probably more about overall computation. The digital computer long ago replaced the clock, the fountain, and the factory machine as our metaphor of choice for explaining the brain's makeup and workings. We so routinely use computing terms to describe our brains that we no longer even realize we're speaking metaphorically. I referred to the brain's circuits, wiring, inputs, and programming more than a few times in this book. But Page's view is an extreme one. To him, the brain doesn't just resemble a computer, it is a computer. His assumption goes a long way toward explaining why Google equates intelligence with data processing efficiency. If our brains are computers, then intelligence can be reduced to a matter of productivity of running more bits of data more quickly through the big chip in our skull. Human intelligence becomes indistinguishable from machine intelligence. Page has, from the start, viewed Google as an embryonic form of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence would be the ultimate version of Google, he said in a 2000 interview, long before his company's name had become a household word. We're nowhere near doing that now. However, we can get incrementally closer to that. And that is basically what we work on. In a 2003 speech at Stanford, he went a little further in describing his company's ambition. The ultimate search engine is something as smart as people, or smarter. Sergey Brin, who says he began writing artificial intelligence programs in middle school, shares his partner's enthusiasm for creating a true thinking machine. Certainly, if you had all the world's information directly attached to your brain, or an artificial brain that was smarter than your brain, you'd be better off, he told a Newsweek reporter in 2004. In a television interview around the same time, Brin went so far as to suggest that the ultimate search engine would look a lot like Stanley Kubrick's HAL. Now hopefully, he said, it would never have a bug like HAL did where he killed the occupants of the spaceship, but that's what we're striving for, and I think we've made it part of the way there. The desire to build a how-like system of artificial intelligence may seem strange to most people, 
but it's a natural ambition, even an admirable one, for a pair of brilliant young computer scientists with vast quantities of cash at their disposal and a small army of programmers and engineers in their employ. A fundamentally scientific enterprise, Google is motivated by a desire to, in Eric Schmidt's words, use technology to solve problems that have never been solved before, and artificial intelligence is the hardest problem out there. Why wouldn't Bryn and Page want to be the ones to crack it? Still, their easy assumption that we'd all be better off if our brains were supplemented or even replaced by artificial intelligence is as unsettling as it is revealing. It underscores the firmness and the certainty with which Google holds to its Taylorist belief that intelligence is the output of a mechanical process, a series of discrete steps that can be isolated, measured, and optimized. Human beings are ashamed to have been born instead of made, the 20th century philosopher Gunther Anders once observed. And in the pronouncements of Google's founders, we can sense that shame as well as the ambition it engenders. In Google's world, which is the world we enter when we go online, there's little place for pensive stillness of deep reading or the fuzzy indirection of contemplation. Ambiguity is not an opening for insight, but a bug to be fixed. The human brain is just an outdated computer that needs a faster processor and a bigger hard drive, and better algorithms to steer the course of its thought. Everything that human beings are doing to make it easier to operate computer networks is at the same time, but for different reasons, making it easier for computer networks to operate human beings. So wrote George Dyson in Darwin Among Machines, his 1997 history of the pursuit of artificial intelligence. Eight years after the book came out, Dyson was invited to the Googleplex to give a talk commemorating the work of John von Neumann, the Princeton physicist who in 1945, building on the work of Alan Turing, drew up the first detailed plan for a modern computer. For Dyson, who has spent much of his life speculating about the inner lives of machines, the visit to Google must have been exhilarating. Here, after all, was a company eager to deploy its enormous resources, including many of the brightest computer scientists in the world, to create an artificial brain. But the visit left Dyson troubled. Toward the end of an essay he wrote about the experience, he recalled a solemn warning that Turing had made in his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. In our attempts to build intelligent machines, the mathematician had written, We should not be irreverently usurping his power of creating souls any more than we are in the procreation of children. Dyson then relayed a comment that an unusually perceptive friend had made after an earlier visit to the Googleplex. I thought the coziness to be almost overwhelming. Happy golden retrievers running in slow motion through water sprinklers on the lawn, people waving and smiling, toys everywhere. I immediately suspected that unimaginable evil was happening somewhere in the dark corners. If the devil would come to earth, what place would be better to hide? The reaction, though obviously extreme, is understandable. With its enormous ambition, its immense bankroll, and its imperialistic designs on world of knowledge, Google is a natural vessel for our fears as well as our hopes. Some say Google is God, Sergey Brin has acknowledged. Others say Google is Satan. So what is lurking in the dark corners of the Googleplex? Are we on the verge of the arrival of an AI? Are our silicon overlords at the door? Probably not. The first academic conference dedicated to the pursuit of artificial intelligence was held back in the summer of 1956 on the Dartmouth campus, and it seemed obvious at the time that computers would soon be able to replicate human thought. The mathematicians and engineers who convened the month-long conclave sensed that, as they wrote in a statement, Every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. It was just a matter of writing the right programs, of rendering the conscious processes of the mind into the steps of algorithms. But despite years of subsequent effort, the workings of human intelligence have eluded precise description. In the half century since the Dartmouth Conference, computers have advanced at lightning speed yet they remain, in human terms, as dumb as stumps. Our thinking machines still don't have the slightest idea what they're thinking. 
Lewis Mumford's observation that no computer can make a new symbol out of its own resources remains as true today as when he said it in 1967. But the AI advocates haven't given up. They've just shifted their focus. They've largely abandoned the goal of writing software programs that replicate human learning and other explicit features of intelligence. Instead, they're trying to duplicate in the circuitry of a computer the electrical signals that buzz among the brain's billions of neurons in the belief that intelligence will then emerge from the machine as the mind emerges from the physical brain. If you can get the overall computation right, as Page said, then the algorithms of intelligence will write themselves. In a 1996 essay on the legacy of Kubrick's 2001, the inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil argued that once we're able to scan a brain in sufficient detail to ascertain the architecture of interneuronal connections in different regions, we'll be able to design a simulated neural net that will operate in a similar fashion. Although we can't yet build a brain like Hal's, Kurzweil concluded, we can describe right now how we could do it. There's little reason to believe that this new approach to incubating an intelligent machine will prove any more fruitful than the old one. It, too, is built on reductive assumptions. It takes for granted that the brain operates according to the same formal mathematical rules as a computer does. That, in other words, the brain and the computer speak the same language. But that's a fallacy born of our desire to explain phenomena we don't understand in terms we do understand. John von Neumann himself warned against falling victim to this fallacy. When we talk about mathematics, he wrote toward the end of his life, we may be discussing a secondary language built on the primary language truly used by our central nervous system. Whatever the nervous system's language may be, it cannot fail to differ considerably from what we consciously and explicitly consider as mathematics. It's also a fallacy to think that the physical brain and the thinking mind exist as separate layers in a precisely engineered architecture. The brain and the mind, the neuroplasticity pioneers have shown, are exquisitely intertwined, each shaping the other. As Ari Shulman wrote in Why Minds Are Not Like Computers, a 2009 New Atlantis article, every indication is that rather than a neatly separable hierarchy like a computer, the mind is a tangled hierarchy of organization and causation. Changes in the mind cause changes in the brain, and vice versa. To create a computer model of the brain that would accurately simulate the mind would require the replication of every level of the brain that affects and is affected by the mind. Since we're nowhere near disentangling the brain's hierarchy, much less understanding how its levels act and interact, the fabrication of an artificial mind is likely to remain an aspiration for generations to come, if not forever. Google is neither God nor Satan, and if there are shadows in the Googleplex, they're no more than the delusions of grandeur. What's disturbing about the company's founders is not their boyish desire to create an amazingly cool machine that will be able to outthink its creators, but the pinched conception of the human mind that gives rise to such a desire.